and we are on the air and you are listening to the Hallie Kesser Jane show. Let's talk. And I am Hallie Kesser Jane. Welcome to my listeners in the United States and around the world. Tune in to the Hallie Kesser Jane show at HallieKesserJane.com. Today on the show, a tour of history's worst plagues with Jennifer Wright, author of Get Well Soon, History's Worst Plagues and the Heroes Who Fought Them, and a conversation with the best-selling maestro of mayhem, Tim Dorsey, out with his 20th Laugh Riot thriller, fueled with his cast of miscreants, Clownfish Blues. That's today on the Hallie Casser Jane Show. Let's get to it. We begin with Jennifer Wright. Get out your face masks, buy stock and hand sanitizer, and batten down the hatches. Germs are catching and the next plague might be right around the corner. In Get Well Soon, History's Worst Plagues and the Heroes Who Fought Them, Wright takes us on a witty and irreverent tour of history's worst plagues and offers up a celebration of the heroes who fought them. Throughout time, humans have been terrified and fascinated by the diseases history and circumstance have dropped on them. Some of the responses to those outbreaks are almost too strange to believe. The author of It Ended Badly, 13 of the Worst Breakups in History, and contributor to the New York Observer, the New York Post, Cosmopolitan, Glamour, Maxim, and more, Jennifer Wright does the seemingly impossible, and forms, makes us laugh, and scares us to death and get well soon. Let's talk. All right. From It Ended Badly, 13 of the Worst Breakups in History, to Get Well Soon, History's Worst Plagues and the Heroes Who Fought Them. That's quite a leap, my friend. How'd you make it? Why'd you make it? It's hilarious. Well, you know, everybody keeps saying that, and I just write about the things that are keeping me awake at night. (sighs) So uh, I started working on Get Well Soon during the Ebola outbreak. When it felt like every time I turned on the news, there was another story about how Ebola was going to come to America and it was going to kill us all. And like I imagine a great many other people, that made me pretty nervous. So I started reading up on how people had dealt with plagues in the past and what are behaviors that help us through society survive or even thrive during a plague? And what are behaviors that can really make life more difficult for the afflicted or even lead to the complete collapse of a society? So the book is really an attempt to examine those questions. Yeah, it's funny that you say that because you know, I'm thinking about, I am like a freak around disaster films. <laughs> I don't know, like, oh yeah, right. Oh, me too. Like, you like them too? Yeah. I'm like, I, I'm just like, oh, and, I yeah, right? I can't stop watching. I don't know what that's about, and I think that that's important to this conversation in a funny way because what is it about us as human beings that we really are, you know, just drawn to these macabre, horrible parts of of humanity's world, you know? You th- and I'm oh, sure, when, absolutely. And I'm sure you were thinking about that uh, when you were writing the book and you got into all of it. But are you a hypochondriac? <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, honestly, a little, probably less now. Um, I, by researching it, I I usually manage to alleviate some of my fears. So I find it very comforting to know that we have penicillin now. Uh, <laughs> nobody dies of syphilis now unless they really let it go. Only about 10 people a year in the U.S. get the bubonic plague, which still kind of surprised me that anybody is getting the bubonic plague. That's pretty wild, but right? We have medicine to treat it, and we can handle it now. All so, right. So let's get into some of this. Book, oh, wait, go, oh, ahead. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. I, I interrupted you. The book you. that really terrified me was the Spanish flu in 1918, which killed 50 million people worldwide. It killed 675,000 Americans, which are more than have died in combat in all the wars we fought. And... Nobody really knows why it went away. Nobody came up with a cure for it. Some scientists theorize that it just killed so many hosts that it disappeared. Uh, so uh, so that's the one that kind of keeps me awake at night now. Well, thanks for sharing that, my friend. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah. Right. Happy to share. Yeah, no, I mean, it's interesting because as we go along in this conversation, we'll see, you know, the great strides that have been made to fight some of this stuff and, and what have you. But when you think about this, that, you think, oh my gosh, you know, sometimes there just really aren't answers. And that does, that keeps me awake at night. What's the oh, difference no. between a plague and an epidemic? Oh, well. Is there I, one? You know, for the purposes of my book, I didn't really differentiate between them. Um, a plague has a little more global scale. So a uh, plague is probably something that affects everyone. An epidemic might be something that is more confined to one place. Although at this point, I think we are also globally interconnected that nothing will ever be confined to one place. If you hear about an airborne disease in Africa, you should start worrying because somebody will come here from there and they'll do it very quickly because we have planes and trains and automobiles and everything else to take you everywhere in the world. That brings me to two thoughts. One is the word pandemic, which is probably the newer word that we use today because Mm -hmm. of the global nature of it. But I live in Florida. So let me explain to Mm -hmm. you. (laughs) That's another country. It's not the United States. We are... (laughs) We are inundated, you know, boy, that summer season comes and those mosquitoes come and there's just, you know, there's always something down here. It's, it's like, and, oh yeah, there are worries about the Zika virus. Oh right? my God, please. It's like, so, and, and the, I can't even say it, the Chat, Chattuka or something like that. Uh, the, every disease that is out there lands here. It may, oh, what, I, don't, you I'm know, it's so a beautiful sorry. place to visit, but it's a nice place to leave too. <laughs> and, <I> said, <laughs> and, and what have you. And I guess Africa kind of feels the same way. That's the other place that I spent a lot of time. But let's talk about the early days of, of, of the, the original ones that you get into in the book. And it, is it that the gods aren't as mad at humankind as they used to be? Because we're, we don't seem to have the plagues that we had when we were, when we go back into history. And we're going to start with you on, on, on one of the, you know, the, the first, but, but just answer that question. Because I think that's interesting. Well, uh, we could say that the gods gave us penicillin. Okay. And they also gave us vaccines. And boy, vaccines are the best thing that has ever happened to humanity. Turns on whether or not to vaccinate your children, do it. They're great. Um, the Aztecs or Incas would love to tell you about how great they are, but they can't because their entire civilizations were wiped out by smallpox within a year. A, a good point so, you make, my political friend. Very good point that yeah. you make. It's so ridiculous, all of this crazy talk. I mean, let's just kill each other by not uh, by thinking crazy thoughts. Okay, so... No, it was very scary for me to realize that um, we now have a lower vaccination rate for measles than countries like Rwanda in Africa. And... Go we don't figure. Want that to be the case because then there will start being outbreaks, and unfortunately, I think some people have forgotten that uh, children really did die of measles. You I almost did. Your- I'm here mm-hmm. to tell the story that I almost did. I mm-hmm. almost, I almost died of measles. So I know how horrible measles can be, which is one of the reasons why I say vaccinate, vaccinate, vaccinate. It was horrible. Yeah, because when I was growing up, we didn't have the vaccine. But I don't want to age mm-hmm. myself too much. Let's go back to, uh, to the beginning here. Antonin plague, i.e. the word. Talk to me. Yes. Now, the Antonin plague was probably smallpox. And uh, it happened when Marcus Aurelius was the emperor of Rome. And at its height, it was killing thousands of people a day. And uh, this is really a case about how wonderful it can be to have a strong leader and a leader who remains very, very calm in the face of adversity. Because Marcus Aurelius, who had, you know, he was a famed stoic, he didn't let his moods be changed too much by outside influence, was really able to just approach all of the disasters that accompany the Antonin Plague in a very pragmatic way. So uh, the first thing he did was see about everything the government could legally do to help people that were being afflicted by this. So he imposed laws uh, about how you couldn't turn your house into a mausoleum to profit off of it. You couldn't dig up graves and put more bodies in them. And the government started subsidizing funerals. Like They did everything that they could in terms of keeping the bodies off the streets. Because once bodies start piling up in the town square, uh, society is broken down. At that point, people will just 
start panicking and looting and everything will fall apart. So that was very smart. There are definitely other plagues where people have not been so good about keeping the bodies out of the streets. And uh, then when the army got decimated and Germanic tribes started crossing over the border, Marcus Aurelius conscripted all the gladiators to go and fight in the army. And then when people started complaining about how now they couldn't go to gladiatorial games, because people will complain about being deprived of their entertainment more than they will ever complain about the disease. The same thing happens during the Spanish flu in 1918. People knew that everybody around them was dying, but they were furious when movie theaters got closed down. And so, What Marcus does Aurelius, that say about humanity? <laughs> um, we really just want things to be normal. We just want things to keep going. And so uh, Marcus Aurelius started staging these shows in the arenas where wild animals would fight each other to give the public something to watch. Um, when the army didn't have enough money to pay all of the new recruits, Marcus Aurelius auctioned off his own imperial possessions in the form of trade and to raise funds. So he was someone who was really able to see one problem, respond to it, see the next problem, respond to it. And some people still say that he did this for about 10 years, and some people still say that if he had lived longer, he most likely died of the Antonin Plague himself. Maybe the decline of the Roman Empire would have been staved off. But unfortunately, helming an empire that's being devastated by plague is like captaining a ship while simultaneously doing triage to bail water out of the hull of that ship. Uh, it's almost impossible to do, and it was definitely impossible for Marcus Aurelius's successor to do because Commodus was just an idiot. Um, just spent most of the time trying to rename the calendar after himself. <laughs> it's interesting when you look back and you went through uh, the history of the big plagues, and as you put it in the book, did you see where people actually learned from each event, or they didn't learn? Well, you know, I was really hopeful going into this book that we would get better at responding to every plague throughout history. I expected to see just a very general upward trajectory up until modern day. On every plague, we would get better and get wiser and get more compassionate. And wow, that is not true at all. Um, it is completely random whether people are going to behave kindly and nobly and sensibly during a plague, or if they're just going to burn a whole bunch of people as witches. Oh, my God. You know, <laughs> really, there's some interesting things in this book, to say the least. But, you know, one thing you did great, I love it, at the beginning of the chapters, you, you uh, put these quotes in that would lead into the chapter. I want to just read the Woody Allen one because it just cracked me up. I really relate. I was nauseous, mm -hmm. untingly all over. I was either in love or I had smallpox. That's me. I think <laughs> <laughs> everything now I'm sick about the whole thing. Who knows? Who knows? This. But you also have these pictures in the book. Oh, my God. Are you kidding me? I saw these pictures oh, of people yeah. with smallpox. I almost had a heart attack. I mean, oh, are God, you kidding? I you flipped to the end with all the horrific oh, pictures. Oh, my. Of course. Of course. I'm, you know, I'm very visual besides being very audio <laughs> auditory. I wanted but, to make sure those were all clustered at the end. So yeah, well, it was a good idea. Just, but that was... Across them when yeah. Read and watch. But uh, some of these have really been just awful diseases. And smallpox certainly is one of those. Talk to me. Oh, oh, smallpox was so unbelievably horrible. And you look at these Aztec and Incan civilizations that were really some of the most developed nations in the world at the time. Then the Spanish settlers come, they bring smallpox, and those civilizations just don't exist within a year. Uh, so complete was the destruction that smallpox brought. And that was partly because... Um, the people in America at that time had none of the exposure to smallpox that Spaniards might have had, partly because it's transmitted by cows, um, which they didn't have in the New World. So uh, the Aztecs and Incas, I think, exclusively used llamas, so they hadn't built up even the mildest resistance to this disease. So, uh, yeah, there's a report from a Spanish missionary at the time talking about how um, 
he's terrified because he doesn't believe enough of these people will survive to make it possible to colonize this entire continent because all of them are dying. Dying of a uh, really horrendous disease a, to boot. Ugly, horrible way to die. Really, yeah. I mean, just amazing. I, I want to skip ahead a little bit, <laughs> and, and I'm taking this out of out of uh, the way you put them all in the book, so just play with me here. No Nose Club. <laughs> oh, I love the No Nose Club. Um, the No Nose Club was founded by Mr. Crumpton, and... At the time he founded it, syphilis was unbelievably stigmatized. Upton Sinclair has this wonderful story called The Doctor's Dilemma about the problems of syphilis, where it was sexually transmitted. So it's about this young man who's engaged to be married, but he has a mistress, and he uh, gets syphilis from her. So he goes to his doctor to see what's wrong with him, and the doctor says, yes, you have syphilis. Um, you're going to have to wait at least two years until this goes into remission, so it won't affect your fiance. And honestly, even that was pretty iffy. Like, let's uh, don't don't marry someone with with syphilis unless you know they're going to take penicillin. You can do it now; it's fine. But uh, the man says, "No, no, no! That would ruin my fiance's reputation. We have to get married now." So they get married. He gives syphilis to his wife. Uh, she never knows that she has it. She passes it on to their baby. Then uh, they hire a wet nurse to feed the baby, and the baby passes it on to her. So Upton Sinclair really examines in the story, at what point is it the doctor's duty to tell someone that syphilis is being spread through this whole family? Um, spoiler, he never does. But... There were a lot of cases like that where it was a disease that was so stigmatized that if people even knew what it was, they would never, ever tell people that they had it. And that seems insane to me because if it advances far enough, syphilis causes your nose to rot off your face. Um, people would make up like very elaborate excuses about how like they were in an accident and now oh, they have no nose. Um, and Mr. Crumpton was someone who had syphilis and was also very wealthy and just decided to invite a bunch of people who had no noses over to his house for <laughs> monthly dinners. So they all went, apparently they had very rambunctious conversations about who would box each other's nose in if they were in a fight. And, uh, you know, it seems like a very bizarre idea. But it's also the groundwork for every support group that we have today. So <laughs> if you know people who you know have Alzheimer's or have cancer and they have a support group that they go to to talk about what they're experiencing, we have Mr. Crumpton to thank for that. <laughs> Back to syphilis. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> That's hilarious. Here's one that I didn't, had never heard of called the Dancing Plague. What? Oh, yes. Uh, the dancing plague happened in 1518 in the town of Strasbourg, and 400 people began dancing, and they weren't able to stop. And this seems like it could be kind of fun, like it doesn't sound that bad, until you were realized, until you realized that they were dancing until bones poked out of their feet. Uh, they were dancing until they had heart attacks in the street. Their families would try to restrain them. They would break free of their bonds and go back to dancing. So this is a really terrible problem. And when I read this, 1518 was also, like, a very popular time for burning witches. So I thought, okay, all these people are going to get burned as witches. This is going to be a short chapter. And remarkably, that was not what happened. Uh, the town threw its very limited resources into attempting all these different ways to cure people. They hired professional musicians to see if maybe the people just needed to dance it out. That wasn't the case. Then uh, they issued decrees about how you really shouldn't play music because you might be depriving your neighbors a chance at recovery. And finally, they sent them off to St. Vitus' shrine. St. Vitus is the patron saint of dancers. And the people supposedly danced around the shrine and they were cured. And uh, now... I don't want to overestimate the curative properties of shrines. <laughs> it was probably because it was a psychological malady. It seems like a pretty clear case of mass hysteria. But it is miraculous to me that in a time when it would have been very easy to cast out these people, 
the community was incredibly compassionate. Uh, they treated them all as victims of the disease. They didn't see them as possessed by devils. And frankly, that's, uh, that's better than we sometimes do today. I'm laughing. When I was a kid, my uh, uncle used to tell me that I had St. Vitus dance because I was so hyperactive. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I guess it goes back to that. Huh? That's one I hadn't heard uh, before, though. Now, here's another one. I'm going to personalize this one, too. This is one of the fascinating things about me when I picked up this book and I said I had to have you on, on the show. Encephalitis, when I was a kid growing up in New Jersey, we had an outbreak. It was one of the. Oh no! Did, are you aware of, of of stuff happening like that? It was. Uh, oh yeah, it's awful. Right, yeah. and I mean, yeah. kids were dropping dead. I have to say, in my neighborhood, and and uh, my folks happened to have been away for a long time, and I was there, and I was terrified. I remember you couldn't go out after you know at dusk because of the mosquitoes, this, that, and the other thing. Uh, that's another. That's another play, though. Talk to me. It is, and Von Eckemo, who worked on encephalitis lethargica talked about how it was a disease that would never, ever be forgotten. And, of course, as soon as we're not being confronted with diseases right in front of us, just forget all about them. So, yeah, um, Oliver Sacks really wrote better about encephalitis lethargica than I ever will. It was this exceptionally terrifying disease where it would put people in an almost vegetative state uh, where they could respond to stimuli, but they could never act of their own volition. So if you fed them, they could swallow food. If you pulled them up by the hands and made them walk from place to place, they could walk. Um, But they could never do those things just because they wanted to do them. And there are some fascinating cases where people contracted encephalitis lethargica in the 1920s, and they were kept alive by their families or put into homes where they were taken care of. And in the 1970s, um, Oliver Sacks obtained new medicine. It's called L-DOPA. And he injected the people at encephalitis lethargica, and they experienced a kind of awakening where for a brief time, unfortunately, the effects weren't permanent. They were able to get up and walk around and share stories. And... It's yeah, excuse a wonderful, me. Wonderful, wonderful book. And, and film. What was the f- was yeah. movie with Robin Williams? Yeah, there you mm-hmm. go. It, what was the name of the film? Oh, Awakening. Awakenings. I love that movie. I love that movie. But the kids around me were dying. They weren't. They weren't put into temporary. Uh, oh, goodbye. Yeah, no, uh, I mean encephalitis is a little different than encephalitis lethargica. Okay, all right, but it was scary as hell. That's all I have to tell you about that. Oh, yeah. Out of all the stories that you uncovered. Uh, extraordinary research. What's the one that that, uh, got to you? Uh, The one that upset me the most, uh, and I I know it's not technically a play, it really shouldn't be in there, but it just upset me so much, was the story of lobotomies Mm -hmm. and the story of Walter Freeman Jackson II, who was just this supposedly very charismatic, publicity-hungry charlatan, who really capitalized on the PTSD that people were experiencing in post-war America by inventing the lobotomy and promising some very desperate people that it was going to cure depression. It was going to cure anxiety. It was going to cure headaches. It was going to cure whatever post-war ailments you might have. Um, And, of course, the cons of lobotomies that rendered people, essentially toddlers, um, far, far outweighed the cons, far, far outweighed the pros. But that did not stop Walter Freeman Jackson from driving across the country in a lobotomobile, uh, just lobotomizing people as he went. Some of them didn't really want to be lobotomized. There were a lot of those uh, so, yeah. who were forced lobotomies. Yeah. I mean, wasn't the Kennedy daughter uh, have a lobotomy? Rose. Yeah. Rose Mary, yeah. Oh, yeah. that's a tragic story. Yeah, a horrible story. Uh, I know. Um, and she seemed like she was, I mean, she wasn't certainly the brightest member of the Kennedy clan, but uh, she seemed like a very lovely, perfectly functional person beforehand. Uh, but the but, stigma. Yes, she was yeah. just absolutely destroyed by her lobotomy, yeah. and uh, yeah, essentially became a vegetable afterwards. Right. It the, was all the, the stigma. Crazy, oh yeah. No, the craziest thing to me was I was reading notes from Walter Freeman Jackson about 
his post-operative patients, and they say things like, Rose is a perfectly happy patient who has the personality of an oyster. She can't remember my name. She pours and pours from an imaginary coffee cup. And then, say, Rose, who was a 29-year-old married woman, would be returned to her family, who would respond with horror, and Walter Freeman Jackson would write them notes that said things like, it seems like she's misbehaving, so she might need an old-fashioned spanking, and then a bowl of ice cream and a kiss in makeup. Um, she was a 29-year-old woman. She was married. That's, uh, that's astonishingly terrifying to me that someone could see those effects and say, I'm, I'm just going to keep going with this. Mm. It seems fine to me. Unbelievable, right? Unbelievable. Yeah. And, and, you know, it, it's funny because if you look back and then you look forward and you go, have we really made all that many strides in, in how we uh, treat people? Uh, it, it's, kind of an, <laughs> it's kind of an odd yeah. deal. So, so here we go. Are we due for another plague? Have we been lucky that there haven't been plagues? Or are there plagues? I'm going to name one. You name it, too. We may not call plagues, but they are plagues. We could say AIDS, for instance. AIDS, AIDS is a plague. Okay, uh, and let me just yeah. finish with a comma before I get to throw it over to you. Or we could say Donald Trump. Go ahead, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I strongly feel like if the definition of a good ruler during a plague is someone who remains very, very calm, we better really hope there's no plague in the next <laughs> four years. <laughs> <laughs> Go, um, but uh, no, I absolutely believe that AIDS is an ongoing plague. And I also believe that I'm a millennial. My generation is the first generation that hasn't had to deal with a plague in our midst in America. Um, my parents' generation had to deal with AIDS. The, my grandparents' generation had to deal with polio. Before that, they were dealing with the Spanish flu in 1918. It seems, uh, I hope we'll never have to deal with one, but it seems very unlikely that we would be the only generation that doesn't have to deal with a plague that we don't initially know how to combat. And I think one of the things that worries me the most right now is that we're finding things that are resistant to antibiotics because antibiotics are... um, really the best thing we have when it comes to combating plague. And there is a big reason that the trajectory of how we handle plague seems like it gets better on like a very slow slope for about 2,000 years. And then we invent penicillin and we find out about antibiotics and it just goes straight up. So when I read about um, superbugs that are resistant to antibiotics, that's very, very frightening. I agree. We didn't get a chance to talk about some of the heroes, per se. I'm going to throw out a name, Typhoid Mary. A lot of us have heard about Typhoid Mary. I don't think a lot of people really know her story. But I don't want you to tell it because I want people to pick up Get Well Soon because this is a great, fun, fabulous, informative read. Oh, thank you so much. That is so nice to hear. I've been speaking with Jennifer Wright, the author of Get Well Soon, History's Worst Plagues and the Heroes Who Fought Them. For more about the book, visit Amazon.com. You are listening to The Helly Kesser Jane Show. My guests today are Jennifer Wright, author of Get Well Soon, History's Worst Plagues and the Heroes Who Fought Them, and Tim Dorsey, author of Clownfish Blues. Tune in to The Helly Kesser Jane Show at HellyKesserJane.com. The best-selling maestro of mayhem, Tim Dorsey, has been called many things. A nut, a nice guy, the artist of literary insanity. He has written 19 Laugh Riot thrillers, novels fueled by a cast of miscreants among them, Coconut Cowboy and Florida Roadkill. Now he brings to us his 20th book, The Uproarious Clownfish Blues, featuring everyone's favorite gloriously unrepentant Florida serial killer, Serge A. Storms. And according to its starred book list review, if you haven't already, and if not, why? Met Serge A. Storms, Florida's most rabid history fan and most cheerful serial killer. Now is the time. Dorsey, a former reporter and editor for the Tampa Tribune, grew up in a small town about an hour north of Miami called Riviera Beach. Currently, he lives on the other coast of Florida, the far west city known as Tampa. Let's talk. All right, so let's start with this, my friend Tim. So tell me about Florida water. 
you, Carl Hyacin, my good friend Dave Barry, all masters of irreverence and the absurd, so filled with insight, all brilliant. I'm calling you brilliant because I think you are. What's the story? You got any clue? Is it the water? It's, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, it, well, like Carl Hyacin mentions uh, <laughs> when, uh, the weather because it's like uh, if you're a criminal and you, you're going to steal, you, you have a choice of stealing cars in Detroit in the winter or in Miami, you know, where are you going to go? So there's this hat, but, um, now just the demographics, um, you know, the, the, the rapid rise in pop, uh, population from about the late fifties onward. And then, uh, you know, the, so a lot of the communities that don't have roots, there's a very transient population. Uh, it's, it's just, uh, I think all that ends up, it's like, uh, it's a recipe for chaos, uh, and, and not being facetious. Uh, I, I couldn't agree, right. I couldn't agree more. How about, how about the heat? The heat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, they say it's not the heat, it's the stupidity. So, uh, <laughs> oh, no. no, it's, um, I, 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 it's hard to explain. And if you tell people, I mean, the main thing, uh, yeah, I mean, now the country is catching on. I mean, we were kind of known for, you know, back in the 90s and 80s, you know, kind of the Miami Vice-ish. Yeah, so they knew a lot of stuff was going on. But it really got weird, like, uh, after the, you know, millennium, and, you know, you have the Florida man thing, and people, now people are just looking for those strange headlines coming out of Florida. I mean, we've become, we have now this national reputation specifically for people just doing the craziest stuff. To, uh, I'll tell you one thing, it's like, you know, people ask about the material, and I say, you know, and it's Carl and Dave say the same things. It's like right out of the newspaper. But you don't even need a newspaper anymore because uh, but my wife told me the story. She got home from work. And the thing is, I've got to remember. I'm, I'm almost desensitized now to something, when something's strange. My wife said, uh, yeah, I had to take a detour on the way to work today. I, uh, uh, the, the road was closed down ahead. Some naked guy was running across the hoods of cars. And I'm like, mm, yeah, sure, why not? You know, it just, it just didn't. And then, cause, I mean, I've, I've heard of that happening in a, in a half dozen cities in, in Florida so far. You know, it just, people just, I don't know. They it's just crazy. It's crazy land. And, you know, it's funny because I, you know, I've been Floridian all, most of my life. I have to tell you, you know, so I moved to L.A. for a few years. And in those years, we had Charles Manson. I mean, but all of the crazy of California has rolled east into the peninsula this is wacky land, and you capture it so beautifully. Let, let's get to, to Clownfish Blues. Oh, my God. Book number 20, That's Impressive, featuring everybody's favorite, gloriously unrepentant Florida serial killer. Only in Florida could a Floridian write about a Floridian serial killer. Oh, my God. And Florida's most rabid history fan, Serge A. Storms. Folks, if you haven't read this, you have to really think when you're reading one of his books. So... His sidekick buddy Coleman, number twenty, as I said, and I and I bet they told you it wouldn't last this long. Are you are you as surprised as anybody that you're on number twenty? Yeah, you can't. I mean, I don't know. I don't think anyone, if they're just trying to write their first first book, sees down the road this far. I mean, I was just trying to get one done. I mean, not even you know, first first things first. Don't even think of getting published. Just think of completing that. You know, you know, number of words. Just climbing that mountain. And, uh, you know, I got the first one published and, you know, I was, I was only thinking of just having, uh, you know, a book with my name on it to hold my hands and just, and that was my dream. And I, that would just, you know, put me on cloud nine. And then it just kept going forward. And I, I like, what really? <laughs> We're still going. And so, and it, it kind of, um, I mean, just the readership, they, they've been so kind and so enthusiastic and, uh, and uh, yeah, here I am, number 20, nice round number. Listen, you, you do good book. That's why the fans, you know, are still with you, kiddo. So that's pretty good, right? Clan fi- oh, thank you. <laughs> Listen, you know, that's my job. But I actually, like you, I, 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 you know, I read so much, Tim. Oh, my God. You don't have, you, you can just imagine. I laugh and I think when I read your stuff. Do you care more about the laughter? Or the thinking? Well, I'll tell you, the, I would, I don't want to be boring and I don't want to sound preachy, you know, or shrill. So I want, I want there to be the laughter. And, uh, yeah, but then I don't want to be shallow. So I want, I want, I guess I want the thoughts in there too. But, but if, if I'm just, if 
I if I start to get serious and I'm just like it, it turns into being preachy, then I'll I'll either cut it out or I'll say find a way to make this amusing. Find you know you can do it simultaneously, and you know in other, and you can find a way to, uh, to to whatever point you're trying to make. There is a way to make it uh, to you know humorous vein. You know that, that that's the challenge. Which comes easier for you? Are are you innately more of a passionate person who sees issues and wants to, you know, put out those issues in your way? Or are you innately funny first? And then which, which, which do you see? Which which comes to your eye first, to your heart first? Well, I, I tell you, if, if I'm succeeding at what I'm doing, it might be because both are happening at the same time, if, that I'm maybe that type of person. Um, and, and, and I also think... It, I think it was to a great degree. I was influenced by like some of the, gosh, when I was young, this is what got me started is I was reading authors that just blew my socks off. And, and, and I discovered, you know, I curriculum in school was boring. I started reading like Kurt Vonnegut, and Joseph Heller, and he's getting, and they were doing the same thing simultaneously. You know, they were, I mean, if you look at Vonnegut, I mean, you know, and, and the the knock on him early on was, oh, it's too easy to read. It's not you know complicated enough. It's it's it's. In other words, it was so amusing that it can't be literature because basically literature had to be impenetrable, you know. But yet there was such humanity and such points being made, and you know. And so I guess all of the authors that I really loved and inspired me were, were doing two things, you know, in stereo at once. They were being funny and amusing as well as you know saying what was on their mind. So I guess I guess maybe I was influenced into trying to do uh, trying to do both simultaneously. So does that make you schizophrenic? <laughs> uh, I, I have been called worse. Okay. So, so, so I'll, I'll take that. Which I noted at the beginning of the uh, intro. But all right, so clownfish blues. All right, I, listen. I, I, you and I are about the same age, I think. And and I'm laughing because of, you know you're you're this is like uh, the the good road buddy TV mega hit um, starring the great Martin Milner and George Maharis replaced by Glenn Corbett I think with the blue eyes if if memory serves me correct in their vintage silver convertible Corvette going down Route 66. The, give me a little bit of background on this uh, story of yours, uh, Clownfish Blues. Yeah, the um, there was these. Um yeah, there was Route 66, the famous black and white, huge TV show, probably the biggest when it was airing in the early 60s. And uh, and I didn't know this. Um, and uh, a reader tipped me off several years ago. And then I went out and I bought, like, the DVD collection online and started watching it. But, you know, you think Route 66, you know, the mother road from, you know, Chicago to Los Angeles. And a lot of the early part of the series took place along there. And then they... You know, as the series progressed, they needed to branch out and have more locales. So Route 66 became less of that road as a geographical line and more of a philosophy of just they were on the road going from town to town, you know, with, you know, freedom of wherever they wanted to go. And in the last two seasons, particularly the last season, they filmed a ton of episodes in Florida, including the, the, the series finale, two, the two-episode finale in, in Tampa. And, uh, and, and pretty much, you know, like the, the last season, especially the last half of the season was like almost all in Florida. And, uh, and they, they traveled around both coasts and spent a lot of time down here. And so when I saw that, because, you know, my, my characters through the books up to now, they're natural road trippers. That's, you know, it's in their DNA. And so when I found out that Route 66, you know, came, spent so much time in Florida, uh, you know, and, and it was fascinating watching the uh, the episodes because they were shot on location, and they're like these time castles of you know you get to see these parts of Florida as they really were at the time. And uh, so I watched all that, and I had my so then I have my character. He gets a, a car like they had, and and he's you know going from town to town doing his you know his Route 66 adventures as well as telling the readers all about which episodes. You know, we're here and, and, you know, what happened, where they were located. You know, they went to, they went to, I think, St. Augustine and, uh, Daytona Beach. Uh, they went to the mermaids at Wikiwachi and, uh, <laughs> obviously Tampa and, you know, down south to the Everglades. So how did you get onto it? I mean, what, 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 
how, how did this turn into this? I mean, you were what you, you were driving well, along and you thought Route 66, or you saw some. Well, how, how did it go from A to Z and become the the crux of the book? Well, um, yeah, like um, well, once I found out, uh, you know, I looked it up on the internet and I and I, there was you know various you know episode guides and I went down to you know I saw these Florida episodes. You so. Like I said, then I ordered the you know DVD set and watched it. No, I get and, that. You know, I get yeah. No, I get that. I just was curious as to like um, why you went there, why you decided that this was uh you know this was this was fodder for you to build a whole plot line, new story around. What was it about it? Well, it, it naturally fit the personality of the series up to that point because a both it. Uh, it had that sense of wanderlust, the freedom that Serge and Cole, I mean, they're always doing this, you know, in previous volumes. And as well as the fact that, like, apart from being, you know, old classic TV, uh, these were little historical, uh, you know, retrospectives of, of Florida. And, um, you know, so it was, you know, basically Florida was showcased, you know, I think in 1963, that season, you know, for for uh, for the country through this TV show, and so uh, you know, it kind of, and that's one of the things I like to do is um, I like to use my books to like bird dog things I really love about Florida that I found out. You know, it's kind of like elbowing the guy you know next to you or whatever. You know, hey, check this out. This is really cool. And so that's you know that was kind of you know and that part of my main character Serge is 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 me. That's my alter ego. I mean, I'm nonviolent, unlike him, but. But uh, it, you know, his childlike enthusiasm for this sort of stuff, and so it was a natural fit for his personality, and it was a natural fit for, you know, the personality of of the books being on the move around, you know, around the state so much. It is, so, yeah, I get you know, it. I get it. It was a natural fit, I, and and I see that, and I, I hope the state of Florida is giving you lots of money <laughs> on the promo <laughs> you're doing for them, or maybe they're not so crazy about it, Tim. This is interesting to me. I remember Miami when Miami had no houses on the islands. But but I say this about Florida, which is always from day one, from when my folks and my grandparents were, you know, early settlers of Florida, if you will. There's a certain uh, seediness at the same time. There is this extraordinary glamour. The only other place that comes close, I think, is Las Vegas. But Las Vegas doesn't do it the way Florida does. And and. Your plot with the, you're, you know, you're picking up that wonderful, um, uh, Florida lottery. <laughs> Talk to me. Do you see those elements? Do you, you get the dichotomy or if you go, you know, the further north you go in Florida, the further south you get. So you get into the old days of Florida and you can get into some of that great, raw, beautiful, untouched land, some aspects of it. Talk to me. Yeah, you mentioned the different elements. It's kind of, you mentioned like Vegas. I, I, what I think of is like Casablanca, you know, in the movie. You know, it kind of has that, you know, sheepness, but that shady undercurrent all the time. And and um, and that's that's how I, yeah, I, I, I've, I've seen that. Um, I do remember the idyllic old, you know, days from, from, the, from the 60s. But even then, there was stuff going on. I mean, I, I used this in a previous book, but... Uh, you know, even back in those days, like the big, the, the biggest uh, gem heist in the history of the world up to that point, you know, was uh, up in New York, and it was some Florida surfers went up to the Museum of Natural History and used ropes and climbed in one of the upper windows that was open, and then they came back down to Florida, and and of course this you know marries the two elements, you know, the glamour and the and other stuff, and they. Uh, of course, they got caught because they were nuts, and they came back with all these stuff, and then they started having these these big parties, and they had this one big pool party where, you know, they were they had all these girls, and they would like they would throw a diamond in the pool, and all these girls would jump in the pool and try to find the diamond. They would do this over and over again because they had so many diamonds. And if you can imagine that happening yeah. back around 1964 in Florida, it's like it was just. Um, even back then, it was uh, it was a little over the top. Yeah, well, I, I I I won't tell you that I was there in '64 for that uh, per se, but I can I do remember my parents used to stay at the Casablanca Hotel. I remember that before the Eden Rock and Fountain Blue were built. I, I Miami Beach was really quite quite hilarious. <laughs> I'll tell you off air stories of mine uh, in Miami in the, in the late '60s. But now, all of that being said, let me ask you this, and let's get serious. 
Uh, what what drives plot drive character for you or character drive plot? Uh, uh, characters drive the plot definitely. I mean, I got I got I, I work on the plot. It's kind of left brain, right brain. You know, I, I, I uh, you know my characters. I I have what they want to do, and and then I have a lot of kind of ideas. I jot down, uh, you know, sometimes even while writing the previous book, if something's not going to fit in. But uh, no, I, the, it's it's characters all the way, and uh, and I'll I'll come up with a plot that they can, you know, acclimate to and, and, and be in character with, uh, you know. But uh, but then that's and that's why I have to work on the plot because if I don't really work on the plot, the characters will just you know run rampant. They'll just you know you'll be just totally you know tangential throughout the whole book. And as far as your key character, Serge, do you like him? Do you love him? Do you hate him? Do you do all the above? How important? Well, I, I, lo- I love him, God. And, and I'm not even, I won't even go down the facetious route of, you know, he's paying the bills, but um, <laughs> he's, I mean, the, there's, there's the part of him that lacks impulse control. And he gets, he flies off the handle with, you know, violently, you know, about that. Okay, that's the opposite of me, absolutely opposite. The rest of him is, is me on the nose. You know, he's my, he's my mouthpiece. All I gotta do is think of my own thoughts. I've just gotta have to, you know, basically take the filters off and, and, uh, and let my imagination roam. And that's, and that's him. In other words, what he does as far as, when he travels and he gets, you know, he gets overcome with zeal about, like, like you mentioned some, just as you were mentioning Eden Rock and the Fountain Blow, my, you know, my mind was flashing on, you know, th- those things. I mean, they're, they're fabulous. And, you know, when I go and explore these places, it's, you know, it, it's, I explore them like he would. I take a ton of photos, you know, I'm just like almost like a little kid on the balls of his feet, you know, and I'm looking around. And I remember, remember at the Fountain Blue, I went down into the, uh, I think there's a, I don't know if it's the basement, but it's the lower level. It's below the, the lobby level. And there's the old, and I don't know if it was that, that or if it was the Doville. It was one of the two, but they had an old barber shop down there. It was still running. But they had all the pictures of all the celebrities from the 50s that had come through there. So I'm taking pictures of the pictures. And 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 it was the place was empty. I mean, there was nobody you know around that whole section of shops down there. and And it really was. It was like walking through. Walking through the fifties, um, so that's that part. That part of him is is definitely me. I think I took, I think I took that part of me and put it onto the character. Frankly, when I when I was starting out the series. So you like the past better than the present? Uh, no, I mean I, I like I like the present, but I like to see stuff that is worthwhile that hasn't been torn down or taken away from us. If you know what I'm saying. In other words, where you, you get to see, you know, uh, how things how things were. You know, I like the past in the present tense. I'll put it that way. Yeah, I, I do think that that's something that is unique to Florida, by the way, because for all the trashing that they've allowed in the state and so much has been wrecked, which is sad. There's still, if you do go down to Miami, you can still walk and and feel the 50s and the 60s and the 40s even um, in the landscape, which is which is re- hard to believe considering all that's been built up down there. Uh, and, and I think throughout the rest of the state too, we also, I, I don't know, maybe cause I'm, you know, um, spend so much time in South Florida. We tend to think that's only the place. And I tend to think of that only as Florida, you know, that the rest of it's just kind of someplace else, if you will, but not so, not so you can find that, uh, that landscape, the further north you go, it's you know it's even better in a way. I I think you you take off by the way. You take three weeks a year, is that, uh, uh, I guess when you're hawking your books, but also on your own to to uh, go back to your favorite place and look well, at it. That's, uh, I, what I do is I really because of you know how how the, the books do well in Florida, and there's so many markets, and Florida is kind of different from other states where if you just circle the perimeter of the state. Um, all the different markets are lined up for you. And, you know, the only real stretch is going across the Everglades is, you know, I'll, I'll hit Miami and then come across to Naples and go up. Um, yeah, I circle the state with, I pack it with all these, um, you know, events. And then, you know, in between events, if I have any, you know, free time here and there, I have a list of places that, uh, either I want to revisit or I want to see if I can find, 
you know, and like, for example, I was going through Jacksonville, uh, just to give one, for instance, and, um, I, I heard that there was one remaining car from the Orange Blossom special that was somewhere out there. And, uh, somebody sent me a photograph and it was all stuck back in the woods with weeds all over it or whatever. And now it's kind of uh, on display, but there's nothing saying what it is. It's just there on the, you know, next to the convention center. And so I, I took a side trip and, you know, went under an underpass and parked there and went over and took some pictures of it. But uh, that's the sort of thing that I, I love to find, you know, after knowing the whole history of that song and, you know, Irvin Rouse being on the platform back there and, you know, writing that fiddle song and then Johnny Cash covered it and going back and finding one of the only train cars, it possibly is the only one from the original Orange Blossom special that's still, you know, you can find anywhere. And so, but those are the sort of things. I have a little scavenger list that I like to tuck in when I uh, when I do that three weeks. I was going to ask you your favorite place. place, but I don't want to do that because I don't want you to tell everybody so that they go there and they ruin it. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I can tell you, and because they won't, they won't be able to. Um, it, it's the Dry Tortugas, oh. uh, and it's it's. It's 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 hard to get to, so so you don't uh, think anybody's going to go in and 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 spoil that great and gorgeous landscape. Listen to me, you write great title. I'm hoping it's you who writes these titles. Do you write the titles, or do you work with your editors to get the titles? No, they're they're my titles. They're your titles. Let me let me just write a few: Coconut Cowboy, Shark Skin Sweet, S U I T E, Tiger Shrimp. Tango. I want to eat your titles, by the way. Pineapple grenade, and and of course, clownfish blues. What comes first? Does the title come first, or do you, you or does the plot come first, or what? Love these titles. It goes, it goes both ways. It, it, it um, sometimes the uh, uh, I, I think of the book and I know what I'm going to write, and you know, simply what the book is going to be about just dictates a title to me. And other times, I can't come up with a title, and. Um, and this one, this one worked out. I actually had this title a long time ago with no book. And then I wrote this book and I was working with other titles. When I thought of that old title and it applied to, um, it, it, it kind of applies to what happens to one of the other characters in the books, which is this reporter who becomes increasingly frustrated with the, uh, the decline of, of traditional journalism. And so that's, that's his growing funk about all that is the blues part of it. And as it relates to him, but uh, so in that case, that's how it that, that's that's how it fit together. You know, I don't know why I want to ask you this, but I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to ask you anyway. There, it, it, it struck me as uh, Trump fits into this our new president somehow in 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 all of this. I, this is this book. I don't know why. Maybe it's the crazy. You know, maybe Surge is crazy. Reminds me of Trump crazy a little. <laughs> No, and I don't want to get into your politics. It may not be the same as mine, but, but you know, it's very. Um, if you think about reportage and and you know, problem, because you're a former journalist, like I, the journalism's going through right now. Um, you know, it is pretty interesting. Yes, are you talking about like fake news and stuff? Oh, that okay. stuff. You remember that, right? We we know about that, right? <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, is, is that what you're referring to? Well, I, I was actually, I, I, you know, there, there's a lot of crazy right now. Okay, I mean, you turn on TV, it, it, it's like crazy. I, and all I, everybody, all I know, anybody that I know is all, all we watch is basically, uh, is a lot of politics, uh, fake news, crazy, uncontrolled politicians, things coming out of their mouth, uh. You know, wacky scenes like we watched the other day with that press, you know, press conference. If that wasn't really a press conference, he didn't uh, with Sean Spicer. I mean, you know, a, a president who can seems to control his um, mechanisms, kind of like your friend uh, in your books. I, I just, I was just feeling a lot of it. Uh, fake news? I don't know what's fake news. I mean, fake news. You know, that's been well, bandered around. Someone else mentioned the same thing about this book, and they said, "Did you like?" You know, right? And basically, uh, I mean, I, I wrote this before the presidential campaign even started. You know, before he came down mm -hmm. the escalator, and I wasn't. And I just, I just, I wrote it about the state of journalism and about what people believe out there. And and, uh, and they said, were you influenced, or did you, you know, did you see the future? And I'm like, no, I just kind of, you know, it's, if you if you're a journalist and you just kind of see how things. Uh, you know, are devolving. Uh, it was just a natural progression for me to 
you know, go there. But, uh, yeah. You've got zeitgeist. I mean, you know, I, I, that's if you can keep your pulse and you're ahead of the pulse when, when the general public picks up it. Uh, on the on the zeitgeist of where we are, uh, that's what makes a great journalist. I always think, and I think you did that in this book, and I think it's worth reading, if for no other reason, to 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 get a little insight into all of that. Not being funny at all, just being really straightforward. You're an entrepreneur, so <laughs> on your website, I mean, just yeah, I know the story about your T-shirts that you were one of the first, you know, people you went to the BEA and brought T-shirts and made a lot of money and got people going, oh, yeah, we can hawk our wares with T-shirts or whatever. You've got a lot for sale on your website, which we'll give at the end of the show. But I'm thinking you should open a restaurant and each each uh, thing that you order should be Clownfish Blues or any of the other titles. I mean, wow, I, I'm, I get hungry when I just read your titles. <laughs> Well, if the, I mean, if there's any entrepreneurs out there in the restaurant business who uh, you know want to do something like that, <laughs> well, that email. The, the building, the building on your website, where you is that real or is that that uh, does that really have a place where you can buy your stuff or is that just you just put the the building up there because that's old Florida? Yeah, I took a picture of an old citrus souvenir place that was boarded up and it just looked it just looked funky to me and, and uh, so I had that so when I had to put a picture of what my store would look like I mean it's an online store there's no physical you know I, that's, presence, you're no right I, but, but I was going crazy yeah, from that yeah and thinking you know I'd like to let Tim you and I let's go into business and let's open that up and put it on you know a highway and, you know a restaurant in it I was going crazy anyway I'm just going wacko on you because I, I, I just finished reading your wonderful clownfish blues and I'm feeling a little wacky. Uh, and, and just, you know, you, you inspire. So I'm going to ask you a completely off the crazy cuff as we shut down on this conversation. <laughs> I don't know if it's made even an ounce of sense. Choose writing or sex. Which do you prefer? I'm sorry. What was that? Ah! <laughs> I have to deliver it twice. Choose writing or sex. Which do you put first? <laughs> oh God! <laughs> uh, I'll take the fifth. I, <laughs> <laughs> you want I, me to I, hold I, you to I, that at the same time? I didn't hear. No, I didn't hear you. What'd you say? <laughs> Actually, I've done both at the same time. <laughs> oh, you have not. <laughs> oh, you don't believe me? <laughs> <laughs> no, I do not believe you. Oh my God. No, uh-uh. Are you telling the truth? Are you kidding me? Are you- uh, I'm going to leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> I've been speaking with best-selling author, master of mayhem, Tim Dorsey, introducing his latest wacky thriller, Clownfish Blues, on the Hallie Caster Jane Show. For more about Tim Dorsey and for information on his appearances, as well as more about Tim and his work, visit his website at timdorsey.com. Thanks so much for tuning in to The Hallie Kesser Jane Show, a production of Resec LLC. The Hallie Kesser Jane Show posts new podcasts Wednesdays, 3 p.m. Eastern. Visit HallieKesserJane.com.